Welcome back to the Jeff Burr Appreciation Show. I kid, but here we are taking a look at yet another film directed by the highly talented journeyman director. This one's a strange one too. If I were to tell you the 90s horror flick included Kane Hodder, Andrew Robinson, Linnea Quigley, and effects by Kane B, you'd be all over it. Mention Pumpkinhead 2 though, and you get quick complaints. Look, it's not as good as the first one, and I'm not here to argue that, but it's a fun flick and a good deal better than what came after. For a great series retrospective, go check out In Praise of Shadows channel and a solid breakdown of everything Pumpkinhead after our review. Pumpkinhead 2 opens with credits and some sweet Law & Order type music, followed by a black and white scene of the Farron Woods circa 1958. A woodland woman is looking for a boy named Tommy to feed him his daily slop. Tommy is a sweet intention but deformed man-child, and that just won't stand for a group of greaser knuckleheads. Let's finish this thing once and for all. <laughs> they chase and beat him as well as the forest woman before stringing him up, beating and stabbing him above a well before dropping him into said well. Dirty job. But someone had to do it. <laughs> Jump ahead 35 years or so, and Sheriff Andrew Robinson is the new lawman in these parts after coming home from New York with his wife and daughter. His daughter runs into the local crew of ruffians, whose leader is the town judge's son. You screw up one more time, I can't cover for you! Hey, don't worry about covering for me. I can take care of myself. This is your group of protagonists that show up in most slasher movies, but here, none of them are likable whatsoever, even the sheriff's daughter and eventual final girl. We then have our real protagonists in the same room together, with Sheriff Braddock and Dr. Pettibone discussing the town, her family of witch doctors, and then they finally meet the mayor. The mayor's name is Bubba, and of course the town mayor's name is Bubba. The bad kids and the youngest Braddock are hanging out, literally, at the site where Tommy was killed and dumped before the sheriff shows up to break up the party. Robinson is first billed, and rightfully so. Not only is he the main good guy here, but he also just has a hell of a resume. Of course, Hellraiser, Child's Play 3, and today's flick for us horror hounds, but he's great in the first Dirty Harry as the bad guy, and then the John Fallon favorite Cobra. The group of kids includes Punky Brewster herself, Soleil Moon Fry, J. Trevor Edmond from Return of the Living Dead Part 3 as Dan Dixon, TV great Hill Harper as Peter, and Alexander Polinsky as Paul. Polinsky moved almost exclusively to voiceover work after this movie, and he's made a nice career out of it. Finally, we have Amy Dolans as the sheriff's daughter, Jenny. She is, in fact, the daughter of musician Mickey Dolans and appeared in comedies and TV shows, including General Hospital. Sheriff Braddock asks his daughter not to hang out with the group of kids, so she does just that and continues hanging out with them. They end up driving way too fast at night on a highway and even drive with the lights off for a bit, which causes them to hit Miss O.C. <laughs> Our fault right here. Where the fuck is she? Does anybody know where she lives? Look, I know. She has all kinds of cool K and B stuff, including the Book of the Dead straight out of Army of Darkness. She curses them with the curse of Pumpkinhead before they go dig up a grave and use some blood from a vial on the inhabitant of the grave, as you do. So I'm sure you can tell, but there really isn't much to do with the Stan Winston classic that preceded this movie. That's fine, but this and nearly every film after changes the rules of what Pumpkinhead is. How he operates, who he kills, and even how he dies is different than what we're told previously. It certainly loses some charm that way, but I suppose it had to do with licensing a film sequel and getting a script out fast. Pumpkinhead rises from his tomb and we find out that Miss Osi is in the hospital, but not looking good. We've got her at the local clinic and it's just a matter of time. The kids agree that it needs to stay with them, and the older folks, the woodland folks, start to fear of what is coming after all of them. Pumpkinhead kills poor Joe Unger, an actor who worked with Burr on Texas Chainsaw 3, who plays Ernst, and it's the best look we get at old Pumpkinhead. He has his off-red predator vision and some flashing lights accompanying him, but he's there in all his special effects glory. After this scene, we get mostly half shots, and the strobe light effects are much higher. Sheriff Robinson doesn't buy that it was an animal, but he also doesn't quite think it's a mythical pumpkinhead creature either. We get the most random Linnea Quigley sex scene I've ever had the pleasure to witness, and that's saying something before her and her lover are attacked by our guy. 
Jesus Christ! He kills the man, whose identity becomes important later, but Quigley makes it out unscathed. Well, physically anyway. The scene is one of my favorites, actually, as a sweet country song plays as the Gord Noggin, sorry, I just got tired of saying Pumpkinhead, breaks the guy's back. They find blood wings written in blood, of all things, on the wall, and here's where I'm going to take a little departure. Blood Wings, Pumpkinhead's Revenge is a PC game released just a little while after the movie. Does it have anything to do with the movie? Barely, but as our former video game guy, I feel like I have to throw it out there. The game is a first person shooter, I suppose, where the player kills enemies and collects crystals that unlock poorly rendered clips from the movie. The controls are bad, the graphics are bad, and the game itself is in fact bad. It was developed by BAP, or BAP Interactive, who created the far more terrifying Sonic Schoolhouse, and published by EA of all companies. It got terrible reviews and was rightfully forgotten to time. The kids all get together and assume Jenny is a snitch to her dad, while the judge tells the sheriff to keep doing his job. The sheriff reveals that he knew the deformed boy who was killed in the beginning, and that he actually saved Tommy from dying at one point. This comes out of nowhere, and probably would have been good information to have, considering where the events have taken place, but whatever. The jerk kids go back to the grave to confirm what they already know, and decide to make it easy for Tommy and hold up in one place for the night. There is a good explanation for all of this, and until we find out what it is, we're sticking together. Kane Hodder enters the chat in a cockfighting ring that draws our pumpkin's ire, and yet another witness was left alive in the now catatonic sister of the victims. The sheriff and the town doctor scooby-doo their way to the hospital to see if they can get anything out of Miss O.C., and she tells them, already dead mind you, that Pumpkinhead is taking revenge on both the men who killed Tommy 35 years ago, and then go for the ones who wronged her. This is a nightmare. She's dead. She does give them a necklace that will apparently defeat him, so you know, they got that going for them. We find out what the five victims have in common, and once the sixth is dispatched, he'll go after the kids who started the fire in the old woman's home. Our actual heroes figure out that the blood wings represent the jackets of the men who killed Tommy, and that the sixth man with them that day was our very own judge. Judge Merle Dixon. Wait, like the walking dead guy that Rooker plays? That's a strange coincidence. Anyway, they go after him, but they're a tad behind Pumpkinhead who attacks him in his home. Oh, shit. But only after Danny begins to hold the other kids hostage after they threaten to go to the cops. Judge realizes he is almost certainly next and calls in the militia to help him, but his time is up. With blood wings painted all over his house and guns that won't help him, he's brutally killed off. The kill scenes are actually pretty well done in this movie, if a little tame. They did have to make some cuts in order to avoid a viewership killing rating of NC-17, even though it was decided that this movie would go straight to video. It has some really good production value, and honestly, you have to credit director Jeff Burr with that. The script is lackluster, and some of the chosen actors mail in their lines. The performance he gets out of Robinson, and the way the movie is shot in general, really elevated above its direct-to-video standard. And that's not to say direct-to-video movies can't look good, but I had no idea this wasn't theater-bound until after I watched it. The script and story were authored by a couple of guys who only have this movie to their credits, and whether or not they were aliases, or this was their only shot, the story doesn't always gel, or even make complete sense. Pumpkinhead, now free of the six men that killed Tommy, turns his sights on the teens that were cursed earlier in the week. He picks them off one at a time in a mostly satisfying fashion. Two of them get a spear through each other with shades of Friday the 13th, and the ringleader joins his judge father by getting his head completely twisted off. Down to just Jenny, Braddock confronts Pumpkinhead, now just calling him Tommy, and pleads with him to spare his daughter. He has punished both his murderers and the ones that attacked Miss O.C., and is reminded that Braddock even saved him once upon a time. Tommy lets the girl go, but is blown away by the very late posse, whose guns work better than any other gun in the movie, and he even falls into the same cavern on the same hook that he did years before. Even though the puppet or costume doesn't hold up when you see the full body, the music playing while he dies the same death as before makes it impossible not to feel bad.
Braddock finds the fire truck he lost there as a kid, and the medallion sways as it cuts to black. Like I said, Pumpkinhead 2 isn't a masterpiece, or better than the first entry, but it's a fun watch and easily the second best entry in the franchise. It just crossed over enough to get the Scream Factory treatment that is sadly way overpriced and out of print, but you can rent it from multiple streaming services, and it's worth your time. While the plot and ideas of the movie are lost at times, that's kind of the pre-Scream identity crisis of the 90s we had with horror movies. Give it a shot when you're looking for those lost gems within the various horror series. You'll be glad you did. Don't call me slick. I didn't like it in high school and I still don't like it. Name's Arms. Nice to meet you.